G'day everybody, and for those who have come in late, you're listening to X Band, the Phantom Podcast. He washed ashore the sole survivor of a shipwreck, and upon the skull of the man who killed his dad, he said, I'm mad, I must eradicate piracy, injustice, and cruelty, and all my sons will follow me, so evildoers will believe that this man cannot die. The Phantom! The ghost who walks! The Phantom! Enemies beware! The Phantom's always there, but you won't find the Phantom. He finds you. Hello, we are the Chronicle Chamber team, and this is x the Phantom Podcast. Our website is chroniclechamber.com, and you can contact us via our email, which is chroniclechamber at gmail.com. You can subscribe to us via YouTube, iTunes, or the various Android apps, as well as you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This is episode 191, and I get the feeling this is going to be a very popular podcast, but first... My name is Jermaine, and I am joined by both of the boys, Stephen and Dan. How are you going, gents? Yeah, I'm doing well, Jermaine. And yourself? Yeah, yeah, no, good. Uh, it's the middle of the night for you guys. Uh, thank you for joining me, but I think this is going to be a very popular podcast. Well, it's, it's certainly very popular with me already, and we haven't even had it. So um, I'm really looking forward to, to talking to King Features, um, because uh, there's been so many questions and so many times they've come up over the previous 190 podcasts that the chance to put yes. some of those directly to a representative is very exciting. Yeah, exactly. I reckon I haven't been this excited since we in, uh, interviewed uh, Cy Barry, uh, trying to get through work and stay focused on work, but thinking and, and stuff like that, it's been, uh, it's, it's been fun. Um, and then it's made the, the task of staying up to the middle of the night a lot easier. It was also um, Hawthorne winning the footy tonight was also a nice way to uh, keep things easy as we stay up late tonight. Yes. I slept, yes. I slept through the second half of that, Stephen. Sorry. So, um, <laughs> I, I slept, slept through the first half. <laughs> so as you can tell, we're very excited about this podcast. And now, as uh, Dan mentioned, ever since war, well, ever since all our podcasts and ever since we've started this podcast, but also the website chroniclechamber.com back in 2007, 2007, that's what, 14 years ago. um, We've always wanted to talk to someone from KFS and now we have that opportunity. So sit back, get that glass of milk and I hope you enjoy the podcast. So joining us tonight for our podcast is going to be T. Um, And so welcome T, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. No worries. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting working through the time, uh, the time zones and uh, being in different uh, continents and stuff like that. So I was wondering to get us started, just so we can kind of learn a little bit about yourself, because I've seen you on a couple of other um, King Features videos and stuff like that as well. But I don't actually know what your job is or what your background is or what you do or anything like that. Um, So if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and then we can kind of go from there. Absolutely. So my full name is T. Fugner. Um, I am the editorial director for comics at King Features and Comics Kingdom, which is our subscription website, uh, comicskingdom.com. You can go there and read all of our comics every day. And uh, basically what editorial director means is that I work with a team of super talented editors um, and credit where credit is due. They are the ones who read the comics every single day. So uh, they, they read all the comics. They make sure that there aren't any typos. They make sure that all the art looks good. Uh, they give feedback to the writers and artists. Uh, and, then, and then those go out into the world. I tend to come in if there's um, if there's a problem, if you know, if there's something that uh, a writer or artist feels really strongly about not changing when we get feedback to change something. Um, and I do help a lot at the um, in the early stages with something like Phantom. Uh, for example, uh, Tony DePaul will send his uh, he'll send little short pitches for the um, for the stories he wants to tell. And so I'll help out with those. I'll read them, give him a little bit of feedback on those if we think there's anything that could improve or, or that we want to hold off on doing. So that's what I do in terms of um, in terms of looking at the comic strips. I also work uh, with our licensed book team, which is run by a wonderful person named Christina. And um, 
and I, I give editorial feedback on all of our licensed books and uh, I do the same thing for entertainment projects. So I'm kind of the, I'm kind of the in-house nerd. Um, so I'm the one who, I'm the one who looks at stuff and says, yes, absolutely. That fits, you know, that fits with the theme of these characters or nope, that, you know, this is not something that it doesn't make sense for this character. The fans are going to throw a fit. Um, you know, we need to, we need to rethink this. And that's a lot of what I do. Okay. How, many, how many different titles would you work across, T? Ooh, uh, over 60. And oh. that's just the ones that come out every day. Uh, there's also a huge library of comics that um, have been discontinued that we still look at license projects for things like Mandrake the Magician. Uh, we did a really wonderful short um, Mandrake series with uh, a company called Stonebot last year uh, that's just that's just great. It's about Mandrake's niece. Um discovering that she has magical powers too and so those are the sorts of things where we don't we don't publish new mandrake every day but we do still do really fun stuff with that character because he's a favorite yeah now my local comic shop um just got the, the third issue they didn't get uh issue one and two and so i picked up uh issue number three and uh she goes oh you're interested in, in uh, issue one and two I said, well of course i am so hopefully i get those soon and i'll be able to uh to read the series in full and the, was it four issues is that right it's four issues there's also a um free um prelude comic on comicsology so that's really great so it's done by a different artist than the books uh, but it's really fun and it kind of sets you up with, you know, who the characters are, what's going on. And it's got its own sort of little contained story. So you could read that without actually reading the books mm. um, if you don't have access to them. Yeah, I remember we discussed this on the podcast and we wondered if it was going to be a bit of a, a backdoor entry for a, a new Phantom series and maybe a, a, like a Young Defenders of the Earth um kind of like crossover but maybe we have something we can talk about later um <laughs> so um so do you deal with the rep like so I'm, I'm trying to think of because a lot of our fans know of say for instance fru or egmont and and, and stuff like that a lot of the phantom fans so do you deal with them directly or do you deal with the representatives like bulls which is sweden and merchant wise which is australia so I deal with I deal with our licensed book system where they send the stuff. Okay. So um, so what happens is we get um, we get at different steps in the process we will get work from um, from Fru or Egmont for us to look at and uh, the vast majority of it is we look at it and we're like yep this looks great you know they they've been they've been doing this. For for so long they they understand the characters real well um and but occasionally there will be something where we write back and say you know what that's not something that you know that's not something that we feel is on brand for the character you know especially i think you know there's always there's always a question of okay is i and i think particularly when you're looking at um lee falk's work as a whole that you know lee falk was so great about changing with the times and looking at you know looking at what he was doing what he'd done in the past and saying okay you know that's that's a little outdated for today's audience we're just gonna like tweak it a little bit so those are the sorts of things where sometimes there there'll be something that has been historically associated with a character and we're you know and we look at it and we say you know what it you know if Lee Falk were alive today, he would look at this and say, you know what, we're going to change this a little bit. And uh, we try to, we really try to keep to the spirit of what he wanted. But uh, within that, you know, there'll be things that we say, you know what, the, we're, we're going to, I'm saying, you know what, a lot, but uh, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to revise this slightly and, and say, these are not really things that we want the Phantom to do anymore or ways that we want to yeah. see him depicted anymore. Uh, but we also do, we do have a, um, it's pretty short, but we have a uh, set of guidelines that we send out to the publishers so that they can see those things and know these are the things that we don't want. Um, you know, we, these are the things that we don't want the Phantom to do. These are things that we want the Phantom to do so that uh, they're not going to get surprised at the last minute. Um, talk, uh, we, we would call that like a, a Bible or yeah. a set of law or something. Are you able to just rattle off? A couple of what you what yeah. what you see the phantom is and what you see the phantom not as. 
Absolutely. So I have, I actually have the editorial guidelines up right now for exactly this reason. So we have, um, we have. As if you knew had a podcast with a couple of phantoms. (laughs) So we have a section in it that's the things we'd like to see in a phantom comic and things that we'd rather not see. And obviously, the things we'd rather not see list is one that if somebody says we have this great idea for a story here's the context in which we want to use this thing. You know, it's something that we can always discuss, but we have, you know, the themes, themes and topics we'd enjoy seeing, things like persistence, determination and courage, justice, international intrigue, uh, environmentalism, respect for wildlife. So those are sort of some of the things that, you know, that we really encourage in phantom stories, things we'd rather not see, cruelty to humans or animals, Um, You know, we don't want to see the phantom become overly dark or cynical. I think that that's one of those things that I've had some really great conversations with Tony DePaul about that, you know, one of the things that's so great about the phantom is he's always got this cheeky little sense of humor in the back. Mm -hmm. And it's so important to the character to keep that or he just sort of turns into a kind of like that generic grim, dark suit superhero and you know and and i see yeah (laughs) exactly we don't you know you know yes his parents are dead but he's not gonna like you know walk around talking about how his parents are dead all the time so those are the kinds of things where uh you know we just yeah we we just want to make sure that people keep his personality uh intact because his personality is i think really one of the things that makes him such a fun character yeah what oh dan you're about to say something Oh, no, I was just going to ask if you have similar guidelines around um, other characters in the, and the, the Phantom Universe in general, like the tropes. Do you provide a list of old jungle sayings, all that sort of um, stuff? Or we, we don't get real prescriptive. Uh, we, it's really like the, the, the document that I'm talking about is like four pages. It's not a, it's not a Bible in the sense of like a big, heavy, uh, you know, a big, heavy, you have to do all of these things things and you know the, this this character only speaks without you know only speaks without contractions don't have them say it apostrophe s i know a lot of you know a lot of uh licensed characters do work with those very big bibles but you know we also trust publishers to know their audiences and to know that you know some of those things some of those things read differently especially with an international audience they read differently in different countries and you don't want to put restrictions on an international publisher that don't make sense for their community. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, cool. Um, oh, yeah, well, I, I appreciate you telling us a bit about that, uh, about the Bible. We've, we've, we've talked about it before. I think we've even, uh, we've even started drafting our own Bible as well of like what we would <laughs> like to see as well. So, um... well, I would love to see that. You know, that's the kind of thing that you know it would be. It would be super fun to you know to get a sense of what you know what fans think are the like major trademarks of the character because these are things that Tony and I talk about these things a lot but you know but and and really you know he's just such a um such a font of knowledge and such a like he he knows every single thing I could ever possibly want to know about the phantom so like you know I know I know exactly where he thinks the character is. I know exactly where I think the character is, but, you know, but it doesn't necessarily always match what, you know, what fans think and, or what fans want to see, you know, sometimes fans really want to see something change. And, uh, you know, and that's not always something that we have, we have um, direct access to. So did you read the Phantom when you were younger? Like, did you know about the Phantom before you came into this role? I did know about the Phantom. I hadn't read a ton of the Phantom until I got to King Features. I've been in King Features for 12 years at this point. So now I've, you know, I haven't read all of the Phantom, but I've read a significant number of major storylines. Um, so, but um, I was, I was a huge Flash Gordon fan. I have read tons of Flash Gordon. I'd seen all of the Buster Crab serials. So that one, um, and a big Prince Valiant fan. We didn't get Prince Valiant in my home paper, but so my, uh, my grandma used to cut it out and save it for when I came to visit. So, uh, you know, there's a bunch of, a bunch of King Features comics that I was just like absolutely enamored of from the time I was a kid. Uh, you know, I, I was not, I was not super, I was not a super big superheroes fan. And, um, you know, and I think it's one of those things that, uh, you know, as I learned more, I just, I remember the first time I sat down to start reading the very first Phantom storyline and I was like, oh my God, 
it actually starts with Diana. This is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> and it was, you know, and it's really funny because I think now about um, what a big deal it was when the Sandman came out and, you know, and the, you know, it was like, where, wait, but the main character, where's the main character? Um, in that very first issue, people were, it was such a big deal that the main character took a while to appear. And then I look back at the Phantom and it's like, well, he doesn't show up until the end of the week of the first, you know, the first story. And, you know, so it was something that you look at and it's like, this is so revolutionary for its time. It's so revolutionary in general. Um, and it's something that I feel like more people should be going back and looking at today. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And, and starting off with Diana, um, don't know whether it was planned or not by, by Lee, but it really brings for the, that family aspect of the fandom with Diana and, and the fan later on getting married, which was, um, and it was pleasing hearing all those things that you listed off that you want to see the see in a fandom comic. Because you know, last podcast, a number of those sort of things were, were things that we were listing off too, as, as well as um, he is a family man. Um, the the the, the fan, the family with a ph. That's the, that's the fandom. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I absolutely agree, and I think the family aspect is so important. Um, you know. Yeah, and I think I think what you say is right. I think setting it up with Diana as that immediate in it, that first POV character also just sets up the idea that you know the Phantom's not always the hero of the story. That a lot of the time, you know, and as you go further into future, you have like sometimes Luaga's the hero of the story. Sometimes Rex is the hero of the story. Now we've got the kids being the heroes of the story. I am just so in love with everything that Tony is doing with Heloise. Uh, you know, I think I think the direction that he's taken Heloise as a character has been phenomenal and really interesting. Uh, and, you know, and those are the sorts of things that really set the Phantom apart from a lot of other superhero stories that it is so grounded in family and that, you know, and not just in family, but community as well. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Now, I've, there's so many questions we've got about the process and all that type of stuff, but I, I just want to take a little bit of a step back and ask a question about, because again, this is kind of like for a lot of fans, like they hear King Features, they hear Hearst. Could you briefly tell us a little bit about King Features, Hearst? What is the difference? Are you the owners of the Phantom? Um, you know, just kind of give us a bit of an idea about this parent company that, I guess, owns our hero. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Hearst is a media company that was started by William Randolph Hearst um, in the, it, it technically, technically was incorporated in the 1910s, but it, you know, tech, but he really started the business in the 1800s. So it goes back oh, wow. quite a ways. Um, and King Features was really the first kind of division within Hearst that he founded separately with uh, a very good friend of his named Moses Konigsberg. Uh, Konigsberg means King's Mountain in German. So uh, so that's where King Features comes from, is from, from Moses Konigsberg's last name. And uh, really they saw, um, they saw so much opportunity, particularly in comics at the time. Um, Comics, if you've ever heard of yellow journalism and the yellow kid, there was this whole real there was this kind of war among the early among the early newspaper owners over comic characters. They wanted to be able to have the most popular comic characters in their papers. And what Hearst realized is that he could take a comic that was getting drawn for one of his papers in one city and syndicate it out to his papers in other cities. And if he there was a city where he didn't have a paper, he could sell it to whatever paper was there. And so now you're paying for one comic, but you're making money from all of these different papers. And, and it also really creates that sort of, you know, the same sort of feeling that we get from like everybody watching the same TV show, you know, mm -hmm. where you can go all around, now you can go all around the country and even the world and people know the same characters and have can have these great conversations about them. And so that's really where King Features came from was just this idea that we could be sharing these comics with more than just our immediate, um, our immediate locale. And so that's where, that's where King Features started. Um, everybody, everybody here knows that Lee Falk 
you know, came on the scene in 1934 with Mandrake. A couple years later, he uh, he brought the Phantom to King Features, worked on both of them um, until until his death in 1999, which is absolutely incredible. Um, and was really, really, really in heavily involved in um, in stewarding those characters for, you know, for that entire time. Um, but basically, yes, the way that the way that comics worked in the 1930s and 40s was that the cartoonists were essentially working for the syndicate. So it would be like me, you know, but writing or drawing. And so as because of that, all of the work technically belonged to the syndicate it works very differently. Now, if you came to me with an idea for a comic you pitched today, you would get to keep all of the rights to your characters. Um, most most comic syndicates uh, and certainly a lot of other comic publishers, if you you know are going to let you keep the rights to your characters today. Um, but that wasn't the case at the time. At the time, the stuff that you created belonged to the the company you worked for and so that's why now yeah. we own we own the phantom yes did you always own the phantom or was it was there like, i'm assuming like a royalty check or, or, or something like that that was given to lee fork um and even ray moore you know i wouldn't know the history of whether that was something that 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 happened at some point but Historically, generally, any comic that was would have been created in the 30s or 40s would have been owned by King Features. So okay. that's that's the reason that we own Popeye. Um, it's the reason that we own Crazy Cat. It's the reason that we own all of these older characters because just that was kind of the way things were done at the time. The really the the movement for creators to own their characters when they were characters that they created themselves, that really only got started in like the 70s. So that's where you start to see the shift to things that are completely creator owned rather than owned by companies. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. All right, well I enjoyed I enjoyed that. I so many more questions but I don't want to get bogged down into that. Um Another question I want to ask before we get into some of the process and, and stuff like that, and um, I'm sure the guys have got uh, as well, is we talked about the Phantom and then you talked about um, uh, kind of like the target audience, like overseas and stuff like that. Like, you know, and I'm assuming you guys would have an idea. Where do you see the Phantom and his target audience is like from a readership uh, age or male and female um and do you th and and then I, I guess something that we've noticed and we've discussed on the podcast is the ability to be able to pass that on to the next generation um so where does that kind of sit with you and how do you see yourself having that challenge to get the next generation hooked yeah i think one of the you know one one of the um biggest biggest issues we see is that the you know the people who are reading comic strips in a print newspaper tend to be a much older audience and that's for every comic strip that's in a print newspaper uh, that's part of why we're we're trying to develop more and more um more and more digital opportunities for comics right now um you know when you you know and it's not you know those those fans are all tremendous and loyal and dedicated fans um and we love them but in term in terms of being able to keep creating phantom comics we need we need a younger audience because they're the ones who are going to be around for the next 20 40 50 years you know so really we want to be able to keep telling stories we want to be able to bring more, more people into those stories uh I, you know and i think that that's a lot of um I think one of the big one of the big things that you really need to think about when you're looking at bringing a younger audience to a character is okay. Are there characters within this story that that younger people can see themselves in? And I think that's one of the things that I really love about um, you know what Tony's been writing for Kit and Heloise is that it does you know it you know they've been they've been around for a very long time, but as teenagers who are kind of coming into their own and taking hold of their own destinies at this point, they really become characters that, you know, I would hope a younger audience can see themselves in. You've got a coming of age story that uh, I think is a pretty, it's a pretty great one, frankly. And those are sort of, you know, having those sorts of stories that 
people can really see themselves in is so important. And I think that's really when we think about what the other things we want to do with the fandom, it's really going to be focusing on, okay, where can we where can we create stories that lots of different audiences can see themselves in? Um, you know, in this case with Heloise, you know, here's a story that young women can see themselves in. Do we want to do more with Julie? I love Julie. Julie is like, yeah. you know, a particularly like the, you know, I, the Phantom by Gaslight stuff. It, Julie's phenomenal. I want to see more stuff with Julie. That's always my, uh, my, anytime anybody dips into a, uh, dips into the chronicles. I want to see more, more Julie. So like, and that's one of those things where, you know, when you have a few, uh, when you have this amazing female character, uh, that's where you get, you know, more women being like, oh, this is super cool. Uh, you know, and I think, um, and I think like, obviously like Diana's, Diana's phenomenal on her own. She's always been a phenomenal character, but having, having, a lady phantom is also just like one of those things where I'm like, oh, this is great. I don't know um, if you've seen um, the, there's a, there's a Julie action figure now. Yes. yes. Yeah. Your, and uh, yeah. I, yeah. So like, that's one of those things where it's like, oh, this is, this is the kind of thing that gets me really excited about characters. Um, and so those are definitely the places where the more we can, the more, different types of people we can kind of help feel reflected in fandom stories the more the bigger the, you know the bigger an audience we can get and the more people we can get excited about the fandom and the better chance we have of being able to publish fandom stories for a very long time i 100 percent agree yeah. to you and that reckoning with the nomad story was one of our favorites at the time you know that coming of age oh world. yeah um, it, one of the challenges, and, and this might be going a bit deep, but one of the challenges the Phantom has had historically is its setting in the, um, you know, the, that stereotype that was established in the first six to eight issues in particular of the Phantom as the Lord of the Jungle and, you know, the white man in the jungle. And how do you see the Phantom being able to empower people of colour? Um, I think there's, you know, I think that there's a lot of ways to do that. And, um, you know, and one of the things that one of the things to think about is, OK, how does the Phantom reckon with that on his own as a modern day character? You know, that's not something that a previous Phantom necessarily would have had to think about. Um, and, and, you know, and I think that actually digging into those questions, OK, you know, what is the Phantom's role? What should the Phantom phantom's role be um you know should should the phantom should the phantom really be a mantle that's passed on to a black character at some point uh dynamite did a great you know did a great mm. series where lothar temporarily becomes the phantom and uh you know and i just love that series i, I think it's a really it's a really fun story in, in, in and of itself but again it's another it's another example of being able to allow more people to see themselves reflected in this mm. character. Yeah, and I think uh, most modern readers would very much understand that um, that stereotype of the Phantom is is well and truly, you know, a product of its time of the 30s, you said before about Lee Falk changing with the times, and he very much did in, in, in this area as well. And, um, yeah, I, I actually see there's a great, lots of opportunities for, you know, as you said before, Luaga is often the hero, Garan's the hero. There's lots of, lots of opportunities for people of, of all... Um, all walks of life to become uh, to become the, the hero of the story. Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, you know, and I think we'll see more of that in the future. You know, I, I think that it's one of those things that I know Tony's very sensitive toward and, uh, you know, we'll, he'll, he's, I think, done, been a great steward of the Phantom stories in the comic strips. And I expect that he will continue to be because those are things that those are things that he's really sensitive about and, and really interested in exploring. And, uh, you know, I know he will continue to do a great job. Yeah. So... Absolutely. We've talked a lot about like what Tony does with the newspaper. Yeah. He's doing an absolute amazing job. But do you have these same conversations with Egmont and Fru and, um, you know, other publishers that may be publishing uh, new content? Yeah, uh, not 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 ever to the like to the same degree of depth, yeah. um, you know, because we do know that we're talking to people who are dealing with different audiences and particularly in different countries with different cultures and 
different issues that are really important to readers. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, that's something that's really important to be, you know, to be sensitive to and thoughtful about. But uh, we, yeah, we, we do, you know, we make sure that they, you know, that publishers understand our guidelines. We make sure that publishers understand who these characters are, you know, that if there's a story that they want to tell that kind of goes outside of the scope of that, it's something that we're going to want to like really dig into and think about when we bring on new publishers to do projects, a lot of them really, really want to go in depth and do like a lot of work on really exploring and understanding the characters for themselves uh, so that they can make good creative choices about them. Mm -hmm. So those are things that, yeah, you know, I, we haven't, we haven't done one with Phantom recently, but uh, we've done a couple, you know, for example, with that Mandrake book, um, we we sat down with the the Stonebot team and um, with Erica Schultz, who was the writer on that. And we had a whole bunch of, whole bunch of like in-depth conversations about like, okay, who is Mandrake? If we're creating a niece for him, you know, we have to understand Mandrake, we have to understand Derek, we have to decide who this, you know, who this young woman is and, um, and really think about, okay, what kinds of stories do we want to tell with this character? So those are the sorts of things that we would do with any new publisher. Um, and it's all also the sort of thing that if a publisher wanted to like sit down with us and be like, okay, we want to think about this. Here's an issue that we want to tackle. You know, that's always something that I love to get, you know, I love to get on a call and talk to people about our characters. Mm. Mm. Uh, do you, just, do you yeah. see the final um, script or the final product of a story before it gets approved or, or are you working from that, um, from that early synopsis? So yeah, so we do see we do see finals of everything. Honestly, by the time it's a you know I, by the time it's a final book, most of the changes that we're gonna see, the you know we're gonna ask for are things like if we catch a typo, um, you know. So um, so that's you know at that point at that point we really aren't gonna ask for changes unless it's something that's that we feel is really really not right for the character. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, but we generally look at the synopsis. We say, yes, this makes sense. Um, if there's an opportunity to look at a script, we also, you know, I, I, I'm sure you know this different comic writers and artists and writer artist teams work so differently. Sometimes mm -hmm. there isn't a script. Sometimes there's thumbnails that get filled in with text later. And, um, you know, so that's something where we tend to try to be flexible, about what stage we see things in so mm. that we're respecting the um, kind of the process of every writer, artist, team individually. But yeah, but we do like to see it a couple times throughout that process if possible so that we can really give feedback. We like to see character designs for new characters or significantly changed characters, um, you know, before they, you know, before they go you know, before they go anywhere, just so that we can make sure that there's nothing that, you know, nothing that generally, we will, you know, a lot of that is making sure that a character doesn't like look too much like a character who's owned by a different company. We, you know, we don't want to get in legal trouble um, or just even looks too much like one of our own characters where we're worried about confusion. Mm. Uh, but, you know, so those are the sorts of things that we like to see, but once, you know, then, then they kind of go back to the creators and you know, they get to make changes as uh, yeah. Mm. So Sounds like, like you've got a really good positive dialogue there and you can, um, there's good back and forth and, and constructive feedback. It, is there ever a part where it hasn't gone quite so well and uh, do you have to reject many Phantom stories or has it always been, always work with them and be able to get them across I, I, the line? It's probably there's... not the right word, but. There's yeah. definitely been times where we've had to say, like, you absolutely can't do this thing. But, um, you know, but usually there's a way to work around it within yeah. the context of the story. And sometimes I'll make suggestions and say, OK, this doesn't really work. But what if you take it and frame it this way? And sometimes, you know, sometimes those are things that you can change just by, like, changing a few lines of dialogue. And yeah. you don't have to, like, throw a whole story away. It's, you know what, let's just have them say this thing here and it changes the context of the story. Uh, you know, so, so we really try to, you know, when we do need, when we do see something that's that, that we don't feel comfortable with um, at that stage, we're usually going to try to find a way to make it work uh, in whatever context we can, rather than saying we have to throw this whole thing away because we don't want, you know, we don't want writers and artists work to go to waste. Yeah. So no, what a good, good. 
would a good example of of that be um the story created by Matt Kime and Shane Foley for Fru, uh Diana and the Heartbreakers gang? Uh Diana and the Heartbreakers, yeah, that well that was one. That's the yeah, we um so Diana and the Heartbreakers was one where we the original version of the script was one that we had gone back and said, look, this is, you know, there's some stuff that we we would want to change to make this feel like more like the sorts of fandom stories we want to tell. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, so that's, that, that's one where we looked at it and said, okay, you know, here are some things that we would, you know, that we'd want to see changed in order to get it to a place where we feel like it's a, it's a, fandom story that is on brand and that you know that we would want to see out in the world mm. okay cool yeah well yeah. that that, that story has just come out it's uh received a lot of um positive feedback um we've had Great. both we had both matt and shane on an earlier podcast um, yeah and it was it was it was really interesting learning i guess the whole the whole process about how it all went and the finished product was, was, you know, was, it was beautiful. It was, it was yeah. Great. And that's really, yeah. And that's really, you know, what we want to see is we want, we want people to be able to create something that, you know, that feels like the story that they want to tell. Um, but, you know, but sometimes there's going to be stuff that we, we have to like help kind of point in, you know, help point in a specific direction. Yeah. And yeah. every, every creator we've talked to has always said that there's always editorial input and, and, you know, yeah. all the time it's, it's for the better because, you know, you know, you know what creators like, or when you're creating your own thing, you kind of get tunnel vision and then you kind of need that outward perspective to sometimes point them in a, in a, in a direction they haven't even thought about or, or something yeah. like that as well. So, and yeah, and that was, that was a really fun story, you know, just the, um, it felt very, um, it felt very like retro, like, you know, kind of like, so it's sort of like um, screwball comedy from the thirties and forties, yeah. you know, with that whole, you know, the, this like gang of ladies who were, you know, going after like rich creeps for their money. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it's just, yeah. It, it's, it's a really, it's a fun story. And I'm really glad that we were able to get it to that point. Cause it, you know, it's like, it's a great concept and uh you know, and I'm glad that I'm so glad to hear that people like it. Yeah, well, it's like through readers like well, we kind of joke that there's a lot of old, old, older readers with the through um with the through readers. We call them Forkus. Uh, Dan is our resident Forkist. Um, <laughs> there's a <laughs> yeah, he's the old guy. <laughs> um, but but there's and we talked about this with Matt and Shane and all that as well. Is a lot of the readers love that retro feel about it so i think that's why that story in the day at the races and uh jungle love which was another another retro type of story that uh shane foley drew as well i think that's why they've been so successful amongst the readers is because the you know uh, through readers understand it but maybe other readers might not get yeah, it yeah and and that's definitely the place where it's tricky to balance knowing yeah. that there are these classic readers who want those retro stories but also wanting to make sure that if a new reader picks it up they're not like what the heck is this this feels <laughs> like something that was written in the 40s which you know yeah, obviously yeah, that's yeah. what we're going for but we also don't want we don't want it to alienate somebody who might otherwise become a huge fan because it does feel dated and yep. you know it's such a tricky line to walk and i do think they ended up doing a real good job with that story yeah cool i appreciate you um letting us in in, in the inside of of, of all that. <laughs> yeah um so you we were talking about getting the new readers and all that um I'm assuming you saw the series, uh, the uh, Kid Phantom and the Phantom End version of the Phantom End Kids and stuff like that. Did yeah. you see those? Yep. Yeah. So is that is that something? And I know you've also changed your style guide with a with a different style as well of the Phantom. I can't remember who the who the draw, who the artist was at the top of my head, but uh, is that? Uh, uh, Argent and an, uh, she's an Argentinian artist. Um, give me one second; I'll get her name. <laughs> um, but is that is that something like where we've talked about trying to get that younger that younger audience? And I've noticed that your Facebook and your social media's uh, accounts have been using those graphics from that as well. Is that is that an example of trying to reach that younger 
that younger audience? So I don't think that I don't think that um, creating the cre- creating the new art was so much about reaching that younger audience as it is um, about our licensed brands. Um, yeah, our license our licensed brand because we have um, for our merchandise licensing. So what happens, you know, we have all of these companies that want to do t-shirts and mugs and, you know, and fun stuff like that. And when we, um, you know, when we go to those folks, they want new art, they want new art, they want different artists, they want, you know, they don't want to see the same thing every single time we go to them. So that is really when we're, when we do, when we do work like that, it's because we want to be able to give something new to the folks who want to be able to create merch for mm-hmm. fans. Um, because, because otherwise, otherwise they're like, Oh, we've, we've used all of these arts, you know, these artworks before yeah. we got to have something new um, so that we can get people, you know, I think particularly when you're talking about the sorts of people who are phantom fans, you get people who want, every single one of something mm. and it's like you know so you want to have what something you with new art too? because then <laughs> because, you know yeah because you got people who like you put something out with the same art and they're like i got that one already but if you put something out with new art they're like oh, i need 15 of these so <laughs> so obviously we want we want to have uh you know we want to have the opportunity to get, bring out new stuff that fans are going to want to buy mm. um but yeah That's but i what? think really one Oh, God, oh sorry. what I was going to say in terms of new fans and finding a new fan base, when you look at social media, one of the things that we've learned from our website is that the fans who find us through social media tend to be younger fans. Um, and so we really we really want to focus on speaking to the people who are using social media, who use social media as the way that they find links they want to click on. Um so, you know, so that's who we're speaking to on our social media channels. It doesn't mean that we're not trying to speak to the classic fans. It means that that's who's listening on social. So we want to talk to them. We're not yeah. going to, you know, we're not going to post, we're not going to post something on social that isn't for the people who are on the social media or that's for someone who isn't there. So, uh, you know, it's the same as, you know, you're going to go to, uh, you're not going to like, go to go to the bank to buy a loaf of bread and uh that's sort of the so that's really when we look at who we're talking to we got to make sure that this is our audience we look at you know we have a we have a wonderful social media manager who does a lot of work looking at you know looking at these are the people who are on this site who are reading our stuff and then she designs all of the all of the messaging for that specific social media platform based on who she already knows is looking at it um, mm. so that we're really speaking to who those p- specific people are. Yeah, I've noticed uh, we've actually talked about this on the podcast as well, that probably in the last year or two, there's definitely seems to be a more of a, a push or more of an interest or more regularity of of pushing the phantom and, and, and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So um, we, we've noticed it and uh, we've Good. been talking to other fans. They've noticed it as well. And, and certainly yeah. the, quality, the quality of the post all seems really good, you know, pointing back to the current story as well as <clears throat> as well as other events of the day and that sort of thing. So, yeah, certainly um, well, whoever's, whoever's doing the social media at the moment is doing a very good job. They're not as good yeah, as our social I, medias. I, let's let's be honest. There. <laughs> no, I'll give it a good. <laughs> yeah, she she does though. She always talks about how the phantom fans are the hardest ones to compete with because the you know the, all the phantom the the phantom fan base has just such a wealth of knowledge and like all of these great graphics and you know so so I feel like the you know that fandom in particular is uh just so keyed in on cool you know cool historical phantom stuff and she always talks about how jealous she is um of some of the cool stuff that the fans have that we don't have in our archives um but yeah you know we really do we want you know we know that you know, we know that there's a you know a big phantom fan base out there we know that the people who are into the phantom love the phantom and we want to be creating more content for them because Mm -hmm. you know they're you know they they're an incredibly loyal fan base and they deserve it uh and you know so yeah we and we've been really really trying to you know build build more um more social content for phantom 
fans and for Flash Gordon fans have been really our mm-hmm. two big our two big goals recently is to rather than just focusing on Comics Kingdom has really been to, you know, bring in bring bring in some social media support for those characters. We've seen a lot of renewed interest in Defenders of the Earth lately, mm-hmm. uh, which has been which has been awesome. You know, I feel like I feel like all the folks who watched it when they were kids are coming out of the woodwork and demanding, you know, more more Defenders of the Earth. We had a great uh toy line in Walmart uh, with the Defenders of the Earth characters. And it's just so exciting to see, um, you know, interest in the, you know, interest in these characters, you know, is sort of growing. So is it the question? The question. Hang on, Jan, before you you ask the question that I know you want to ask, I want to ask a question. Okay. Um, So we got these toy lines now that are in your Walmart or department stores. is there any chance that we might see, you know, T-shirts and, and stuff on the Defenders of the Earth? So, you know, things like Phantom and Flash Gordon, Mandrake hitting uh, department stores as well? I know that if our licensing p- people have anything to say about it, absolutely. Uh, you know, but that's really, you know, it's one of those things that I know they would love to see more of that. Um, I don't know if, you know, I, I'm I'm on the editorial side, so I don't always yeah. know what they're working on. But I know that, you know, we've got a licensing team who loves Defenders of the Earth and wants to see more Defenders of the Earth stuff, um, I, you know, in a couple cases, probably so that they can wear it themselves. <laughs> and, um, you know, and so that's one of those things where I, I, you know, I think everybody at King certainly hopes so. And and, uh, you know, just if if everybody who wants Defenders of the Earth stuff says stuff real loud, uh, <laughs> you know, hopefully we can get some. Uh, you, you heard it, fan base. Send your emails to... But it's um, interesting uh, talking about uh, Flash Gordon and on Comics Kingdom because my local paper... Um, doesn't print the fan- Phantom on a Sunday, so I go to Comics Kingdom on a on a Sunday, and always at the top you see the flash forward uh, strip, and um, I tend to always click on it as well before I go read my Phantom. And uh, having said that, I like the I really like the way that for the Sunday Phantom, um, you click on it and it then goes into like a vertical. Make sure I get my directions right. Yeah, vertical, and so you can you scroll it rather than having to try and pinch and, yeah. and and zoom so whoever did that up over there on the um on the website for, especially for the mobiles great job on that on the Thanks. sunday there yeah we've been trying to you know one of the things that we've seen is our, our mobile audience is growing you know by leaps and bounds and more and more people read on mobile so we're trying to make we're trying to make our comics as friendly to mobile readers as they are um on you know on desktop because i think it's uh you know that's really how people are reading comics and that's what you know mm. we want to make sure mm. that they're they're fun to read however you're uh, reading them mm. yeah well both both Fru and team phantom Man have started reputting their comics on digital as well now yeah I want to go back to Defenders of the Earth. Before, before um, you do. <laughs> Come on. Really, right? Jim? I didn't, I didn't see that you... <laughs> I've already been pushed back twice. All right, come on, Dan. No, I was, I'm, I was just uh, interested in uh, just tying together a couple of things you said there, T, about um, uh, providing content to a lot more people. We were also talking about merch and that sort of thing. Um, one of the things about the Phantom and, and, and Jermaine and I and, and Steve are all collectors, obviously... Um, there just doesn't seem to be as much merch for the fandom as there is for your Spider-Mans and your Supermans and your Batmans and, and all the rest of it. What, what do you put that down to, dear? Because we'd love to see it in stores everywhere as, as we see these Marvel and DC characters. I, I would put that down to those Marvel and DC characters being owned by much bigger corporations. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, and that's really, I think that's really what it comes down to is, uh, you know, we're, you know, Hearst is, Hearst is a big company, but we're, we're like little scrappy, you know, we're scrappy and little next to, uh, you know, when you put us next to Disney or Warner Brothers and, and that's, I think, you know, and well, Warn and now Warner Brothers is AT&T. So there's definitely, you know, that, so that's definitely one of those things where they've got, you know, the, you know and you've got, you, you're talking about companies that have their own movie movie studios. You know, we we you know we want somebody to make a movie. We have to you know go, talk, walk you know go around and uh, and chat with lots of people and find somebody who's excited to do that. Um, you know, they I, I'm sure that you know they can just be like, hey, we're gonna make a movie. You know, they 
Mm. We're we're gonna make a movie about Guardians of the Galaxy. It has a talking rac- raccoon in a tree who only says one word, and you know, and it's just uh, you know, and I I love Guardians of the Galaxy, but you know, it seems like there's a lot more ease of getting these things to more and more people than yeah. a company like King Features has. So, um, so you know, yeah. yeah. So so. Tell everybody you want to see a phantom movie or a phantom TV show. And, uh, you know, and that's that's really the way to get more merch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. okay. Well, I think so that's going to tie in. It's about, yeah, it's about <laughs> 40 questions I've got going. <laughs> so, um, so, I, so do you, when you talk about the, the process of merch and stuff like that, and we'll, we'll be honest, we've heard, we've, we've heard what some people have said. You know, there's always three sides of the story and stuff like that as well. Is it do, is it purely because there's unrealistic expectations from the the person that wants to do it? Is it because uh, you know, the, the like you as you said, you are a smaller company, so it's it's you know things aren't as set out as easy or clear steps as say a larger company or or you know like. Could you, you know, what, what, why don't we see it? Is it, you know, why don't we see more, more stuff coming out? And why do we hear stories of people that, you know, tend to go down that path and then they stop or, um, yeah. I'm not entirely sure what stories you're talking about. So, yeah. um, <laughs> yeah. So I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly what you're talking about when you say that. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not on the licensing yeah. team. Uh, okay. So I can't, you know, so there's only so much I can say, with, like, and yep. what I'm saying is conjecture. Um, but yeah, you know, I think, I think that really when we're, you know, what we're seeing is we're seeing we, if there's demand for something, we can get a deal for it. And so that's really, you know, make your, make your wishes known and our licensing team will be able to get a deal for it. Okay. So I, yeah. I think it's fair to say that the demand's not there at, at the moment. And that's why we're not seeing more products. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I would say that, yeah, you know, for the most part, we want, we want to see that demand and that's where yeah. like something like those defenders of the earth toys, it's so exciting to see those. Um, and uh, you know, but, but yeah, like I think, and I think that's part two is, is, Focus, you know, if you focus on like specific, um, specific merch yep. that you want to see, that can help a lot too. Because like we've done, we've done pretty well with action figures in the past couple of years. Yes, but yes. you know, if there's, you know, if you want to see a phantom tabletop game, you know, that's one of those things. Like you know, that knowing what fans would want to buy, um, mm. um, and and particularly having publishers or merch producers know what fans would want to buy is always a big help for us because yeah. you know because if they if people are like okay you know this is a character who you know there's there's a lot of people who haven't heard of this character but there's a really dedicated audience for this specific thing i think one of the wonderful things about the internet is that it allows niche brands to find their audience and then yeah. to be able to, to be able to get products made for that specific audience. Mm. Um, so that's where, you know, that's where if, you know, you can get like, you, you can get an idea of, okay, here are the things that this fan base wants. And if, and if those are things that you know of and you want to drop us an email and say, Hey, we know that Phantom fans are really looking for, I don't know, thermoses. Um, you know, then, then our licensing cool. team, yeah, then, then our licensing team can go, uh, you know, can go talk to people who make thermoses. Cool. <laughs> I think you're right before what you said though, that, um, a movie or a TV series would, would really give this stuff rocket fuel. So, uh, it, it raises the obvious question. Uh, you know, it's, it, uh, it's nine, 25 years this year, this month, I think, since, uh, the Billy Zane movie came out. Yes. Um, are we? Is there any hope of a movie or a TV series in the future? Do you think? Um, you know, it's definitely something that we want to see happen. Um, I, it's you know, there's 
I would love to see a phantom movie or TV show. Everybody at King Features would love to see a phantom movie or TV show. Um, you know, there's there's a point at which I I can't say too much on that one. Um, but you know, but definitely it's something that King Features is very much behind, and we would be very excited to see in the future. So. <laughs> Does that mean that user actively shopping around the license or has someone got the license? That's the part where I said I can't say too much about it. <laughs> so try that, have, Jim. Have to, you're ask. just going to have to guess, go man. with, yeah. Um, um, but with you're mentioning everybody about... Everybody at King Features really wants to see it. <laughs> well, so, well, so do we, of course. So do we, yeah. Um, now, we were talking about Defenders of the Earth uh, just earlier. Um, is there much... And that was, you know, a great crossover series. And this is where I'm leading the question. We've had a few series over here now um, with some through built characters, um, such as the Raven and um, uh, so the Shadow and, and a few others like that. Um, is that something that uh, you guys like to like, like to see or like to see more of or, or think this was a nice experiment or we still, is the jury still, still out on that sort of a crossover thing? Or do you want more? Think, want to go with more established characters again, like Flash and uh, Flash Gordon and Mandrake? Well, when it's Flash Gordon and Mandrake, it's easy because we own them. Yes. So <laughs> you know, so that's one of those things we love to do stuff with that you know that crosses over our characters. I'm still really, really looking forward for the like you know Phantom Rex Morgan crossover. I feel like, you know, you know, <laughs> Phantom's got to go to the doctor sometime, right? So, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I think that there's that maybe, maybe, you know, maybe we can, you know, get some of our, you know, get some of our cartoonists who own their work in on this and do like, a, you know, you know, Phantom and Zippy the Pinhead crossover. And there's like a terrible, like, crime spree in Dingberg that Phantom has to solve. But yeah, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think it depends on the characters. I think it depends on whether it's a right, it makes sense, um, whether it's a good fit. Uh, I, I really liked the Raven story. I thought that one was really fun. Um, you know, so something like, you know, so I think it really just depends on, uh, you know, is this something we want to do? There's, you know, there's editorial concerns and there's licensing concerns with things mm. like that. So, you know, um, so my, you know, my answer is going to be on the editorial side, which is like, some of these stories are super fun. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really fun to read. And it's fun to see these characters interact, um, you know, especially when they're characters that kind of like, one of the great, th you know, one of the things that I love about the Phantom is because you can go back in history and you can do all of these stories from like, you know, the 1700s and the 1800s, you have this opportunity to have him cross over with all kinds of like fictional characters from history. And that stuff I love. So, you know, I'm, I'm always going to be a little bit gung ho to see more of it uh, when, uh, when people have, you know, when people are interested in doing it, because it's, it's very neat to think about, um, okay, well, you know, there would have been a phantom who would have, you know, could have possibly interacted with this, you know, with, I'm trying to think like Dorian Gray or, you know, somebody, somebody cool that would be a really fun story to tell. And, um, and so like, that's one of those things that, yeah, you know, if, if somebody's got a cool idea, I'm, you know, I'm always going to be excited to read it. Yeah. And we do see a lot of those type of stories, in, yeah. especially uh, Egmont and Team Fantasy yeah. as well. Yeah. What do you what do you think about a a, a character like Phantom Crusader then? Or the, there's um, certainly been um, the, in the Night of Malta, I think, was an, an older Egmont story as well. So we've got the Phantom character set well before you know the first Phantom would have existed. Um, do you uh, do you have? Well, and, and conversely, our last um, our last uh, podcast was about future Phantom. So uh, Phantoms that are well into the future, or, or even well well into the past before that fits in the 400, 500 year chronology. Yeah, I mean, I my, my take on that is as long as it's presented as speculation, it's great. Um, yeah. You know, my, my I feel like it's really important to keep like, to keep Lee Falk's original, or, you know, what, what Lee, Lee Falk's original, you know, set origin story, mm. you know, that, that this is what happened, you know, the first Christopher Walker washed ashore, 
he, you know, he, he did his phantom oath. He built his, you know, he, he, he built uh, the skull chair and skull cave and all of that stuff. That's super like, to me, that's super important to just be like, okay, this is where the phantom starts. And right now, Kitten Heloise is about as late, far into the future as you can go and say mm -hmm. this is definitely what happened. If people want to play around with like, hey, it's really, you know, there, you know, what would the Phantom have looked like if he'd existed earlier with the Phantom Crusader? Mm -hmm. um, what could the Phantom look like in the future? Those are all, you know, that's all super fun as long as, you know, as it's long so as the nice. people creating them are careful to frame it as speculation, you know, as yes. like as kind of phantom spec fic, uh, rather than rather than this is definitely the history of what happened. Yeah, and I think we got uh, much the same sort of thing from Andrew, who wrote um, the the oh, I can't remember Future Phantom, the, what the Android, the, for, the Android, phone, yeah, yeah. So it's more like yeah, it's a comic. You can, you got you can do all sorts of things, but it's not like it's law. It's just a an idea that may happen in the future, but yes. don't don't make it as gospel. And, and that's an interesting thing about Phantom fans, and, and we've had this conversation so many times on the podcast about what is Phantom law. Um, and I'm and I'm firmly and and I'm not just trying to suck up tea because I've, um, I'm firmly on the record with this. But I would regard the newspaper strip as law, and anything else outside of that that differs from that is speculation or, or wrong. Um, whereas, <laughs> whereas Germ's probably a little bit more open-minded than I am. Um, so, but but um, is that what you measure everything against? You've, you've mentioned Lee Fork and Tony DePaul a number of times, obviously. But if it doesn't fall within what they might have created, then it then it's um, that's when it starts to tread into dangerous areas. Um, it depends because, uh, you know, you, you know, you know, Tony's pulled stuff from, you know, pulled stuff from the Fru and Egmont books and brought it back into the strip. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I think it's, I, don't, I, I wouldn't say it's dangerous. What I would say is that it's not necessarily canon. And it's yeah. something that, for example, if somebody, if somebody at Fru wrote a story and somebody at Egmont wrote a story that conflicted with that story, you know, that's that's great you know within that it's fine like you know it might there's definitely fans who i know get frustrated when things don't line up perfectly but you know our licensed book publishers can write the stories that they want to write within the worlds that they've created and they don't always need to line up because we're you know we're licensing the characters to do what they want to do with them um and they might want to do different things occasionally but I do think that when it gets to, you know, when it gets to, okay, what's the, what's the official lore? What, what are we working off of when we talk about, you know, when we talk about where, you know, where the Phantom's been and where the Phantom's going, the stuff that is in the comic strip is the stuff that King Features tries to maintain as here's what, you know, here's what's happened. Here's where everybody is. And, you know, here's where everybody's going. So it seems like, from what I understand, and I might be understanding this wrong, that it seems like Fru and Egmont are kind of not as much under control of you. They're kind of sort of free to do their own thing or they've got looser. Yeah. You, yeah. You know, that's one of those things where, again, like I said before, they've got these incredibly loyal audiences um, yeah. who aren't, newspaper comic strip readers they're you know they're they're scandinavian and australian comic book readers and that's not the, that's not the same audience you know and we're not gonna try to make it be the same audience there's a degree to which we want to make sure that if you know it's if someone who's phantom. right that if somebody from one place picks something up somewhere else that they're not like horribly offended by it or, you know, or up, or it's not the brand that they expect. I, I think one of the examples I always talk about with this is um, the DC character Starfire uh, that, you know, Teen Titans, the Teen Titans cartoon that was out in the 2000s got all of these young girls really excited about the character Starfire. And then they went to read the comics about Starfire at the time. And the Starfire character in the comics was completely different from the Starfire character in the cartoon. And it was a time when, you know, this, this kind of this audience just kind of got let down by what was available for them. And so we want to make sure that if somebody's picking something up, that they're not going to be let down by what they see yeah. there um, because they, 
are coming from somewhere else where the phantom is different. But beyond that, yeah, you know, we're, we, you know, we trust, you know, we trust our publishers to be creating stories that, that resonate with their audiences. And if that means occasionally something is not, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna like nitpick, you know, we're not gonna like nitpick the Phantom Chronicles, basically, Mm -hmm. you know, if something's, uh, you know, if somebody's like, oh, well, you know, we think the Phantom in 1913 was like this, and someone else is like, well, we think the Phantom in 1913 should be like this. They can have different phantoms, you know, that's totally okay. Um, But we, you know, and that's why I think it's easier for us to just focus on here's what, you know, here's what we, you know, here's what we control, here's what we write. Um, And, you know, if things go off a little bit, that's totally fine because they're really for different audiences. We just don't want, we don't want somebody to pick something up and be, you know, and be shocked or, or, you know, or, or, you know, uncomfortable with what they see because it's not what they're expecting from the Phantom as like a comic book brand. Okay, so we're talking about shocking, and I'm sure this is maybe where Dan's going, is one of the things that we've disagreed and we've been quite shocked and there's even been a a good discussion or two uh, is Sandal Singh and her son, Nadia. Now, I'm I'm assuming you're aware of, of this, where, I am aware of this. Yes. So, from what from what we understand is, um, if this story plot came to you now, it would be rejected. But is that would that be true? I would say. I mean, I I think it, if this story plot came to us now, we would probably chat about it and figure out a way to like, you know, to make something work that you know that appealed to the appealed to the creators but you know but didn't fall outside of the guidelines that we're trying to create Mm. you know because i feel like that's one of those things that there's you know when you get around the table and brainstorm you can always come up with something cool yeah Mm. Yeah. but fair to say the idea of um nadir and and um potentially being the phantom son and the way that that was conceived and all the rest of it fair to say that falls outside what you'd be looking the character to be represented yeah these days for sure yeah you know it's something that it's it's definitely something that we probably would say is out of character for kit walker yeah and it's fair to say we agree (laughs) it's fair to say that it's potentially the uh the phantom's child so well they've got to work a way to to, uh write their way out of it now jim well yeah (laughs) i i I, so have you so have you um because uh, have you talked to Egmont about this story plot? Do, do, and yeah, about... do, you, do you have involvement in, in helping brainstorm their way out of this mess? <laughs> um, we haven't we haven't had that discussion yet, you know. But you know, I'm sure we'll you know at some point it might come up. If you know, yeah, you know, we'll we'll. These are these are also the things where we recognize that there wasn't you know the, the our new we have a new approvals process. This is relatively this is relatively new, um, and we recognize that we're we're talking to folks who didn't have as much you know they didn't have as much input from King Features in the past, and sure. some of that's going to take a little while to get used to, and that's okay. You know everybody's you know. Yeah, everybody's been really welcoming of, you know, of changes to these things. So, you know, it's, I don't think it's going to be a problem and we'll, we'll all, uh, we'll all figure it out together. So you just, you just, sorry, you just used the word approval process and yeah. a, a new, so um, I'm assuming that Egmont now has to follow this approval process or is a part of the approval process is, is that what yeah there is yeah so there we have a standard approval process now and it's something that our what happened was we we have you know Egmont and Fru have been publishing phantom books for years and years and years and we established this approval process at first with our newer publishers and now you know over the past couple years we've been bringing our older publishers into it um you know so it's you know yeah and we realize that it's not something that you know it's not something that they've done before and we're gonna you know we're gonna work with them to make it as easy as possible um so you know and some things were kind of you know some things were testing the waters and we we did some stuff with fru that we we tried and we're like you know what, we don't actually need to do this part. And and they they stopped sending us some stuff because we didn't actually need to look at it. Um, oh, awesome. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so there's definitely been some kind of, you know, figuring out, figuring out what works for each publisher and, and making sure that nobody's, you know, nobody's getting slammed with a, a ton of additional work in order to yeah. just like make sure that King Features is seeing everything. And, and I think that, um, you know, you wouldn't want to be seen as someone who's, you know, the puppet master and making sure that everything is exactly as you, and I, I, we're very much getting that sense that um, you're, you, you want to work with people and um, let them have, have license, pardon the pun, but let them have some scope to, to do what they want to do. Um, but by the same token, um, you absolutely need oversight to make sure, as you've said a number of times, that the, that the character stays, stays true to being who the fandom really is historically um, and, and traditionally, because that character has been really, really successful and popular for a good reason. And uh, if people stray from it too much, then um, they run the risk of, of destroying the brand, really. Yeah, you know, I mean, and I think, you know, I think I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go so far as to say destroying the brand. But but I, I our biggest concern is that the brand may mean different things to different people if the stories get too far apart and then it's harder you know and it's harder to have a movie that everybody loves right it's harder to have a tv show that everybody loves if you've got an audience in one place that expects the phantom to be one thing and an audience in another place that expects the phantom to be another thing so so yeah so like we want to make sure that the characters are kind of you know just you know just within enough guidelines that when we get that phantom movie made or when we get that phantom tv show made everybody can sit down and enjoy it together and nobody's like wait yeah. this isn't the phantom i grew up with yeah yeah, absolutely. yeah. and would, would that mean that and this is um i might have arguments with jermaine and others about this but i always see the phantom as 21 it's the 21st phantom whether it was 1945 or it's 2025 it's the 21st phantom do you see that ever shifting like in about 50 years when you know, maybe in comic book years that, that's only like being 15? <laughs> it's definitely funny because there's points where now like, you know, if you have Kit have like a flashback to something that happened 20 years ago, it's all, it's later than, you know, it. it it, it, the the timeline doesn't quite work anymore. Mm. Uh, you know, you've got the whole telescoping timeline issue that you have with, uh, you know, with like Marvel characters where like, I don't want to even get into Magneto, but, um, you know, fortunately the Phantom isn't so, so tied to, um, you know, to individual dates in the same way. But, um, you know, so yeah, you know, it could be, that's one of the things that I think is really fun about playing with like Kitten Heloise and the legacy, you know, maybe, maybe at some point, one of them will take over, maybe we'll, you know, you know, and that might be a place to branch into other stories where we, you know, there could be a, we keep doing 21st Phantom stories because we know there's an audience who loves that character. Um, at, but, but you can also do stories about the 22nd Phantom or, Two twenty second phantoms, maybe. You know, we'll see how well, that works out. Well, Egmont's doing that at the moment with the uh, yeah. 22nd Phantom Saga. And that that's been getting a oh, lot yes. of yeah. the empty throne. Yeah, the empty throne yeah. saga. That's been getting a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of fans tend to uh, are liking that. So um yeah, that's good. And Tony Dupour has said on the podcast that he wants to write that he thinks he's got a story in him about um about the 21st phantom dying yeah. I, I told him that'll break my heart i, I really don't yeah, want to read that i've said that on the <laughs> podcast before well. please, please don't ever write it he might he might have it in his head but please don't ever write it i think <laughs> might have been, what, was what i might have said all right well you know i i, I don't want to say anything but uh you know keep <laughs> keep your eyes on the strip <laughs> Well, it's well, uh, uh, it's it, it's an interesting one because we we've again it's a conversation we've had many times, but there's a, a solid argument to to move the Phantom into the those you know twenty second Phantoms, mm -hmm. and um, it's a shame in a sense, and I've and I've said this before too on the podcast, but it's a shame in a sense that Lee Fork didn't establish a routine of every twenty years um, or twenty five or something rolling into the next generation, so um, the so that the um, the timeline what's the is word? The, the really OCD people <laughs> can go, yeah, the, the dates do all line up. Yeah. And there's not that no, my, my dad, who was the Phantom in 1910, 110 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> right. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So where are you of time? Uh, I know we've only <laughs> got you for another 15 minutes. So we'll try, yeah. and, we'll try and shoot through some more questions. Um, okay. Dan had a, uh, a brilliant question um, about the 100th anniversary. That's not coming. That's not too far away. Um, that is, well, it's, it's, in, it's in 2036. 15 years. Yeah, 15, 15 years. years. 15 years. It was, it was not too far away in, this, guess... in, the, in the sense of a century, but, but it's. <laughs> Still a fair way. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. not quite on our planning calendar yet. Yeah. No, I can imagine. But I guess my the, the, the reason I thought of it was that I wondered what the longer term um, goals are for the character. Like by the time we get to the 100th birthday of the character, where do you, where would you like the the character to be? Or, or as, a, as a company, where would the obviously as successful as possible? I oh, imagine. yeah. You know, I, I want I want the phantom like on, you know, like tattooed on everybody's shoulder. Right. You know, want everybody to like have like good mark rings and uh <laughs> so have it be like the coolest thing on earth but uh yeah you know i feel like i feel like for me um what i'd really like to see is you know i i think having knowing that there is a you know a great publishing program out there uh you know with you know the, the partners we have now are great it would be great to have a couple more uh folks publishing phantom stories i'd love to see um you know some phantom stories and some formats that you know where where he hasn't gotten a lot of love i think one of the things we, we look at right now is like the absolute astronomical growth of the graphic novel um format uh you know i'd love to see i'd love to see something in a graphic novel format i'd love to see something in um you know and i i I hesitate to use the word manga because I don't necessarily mean manga style art, but in a manga book style would be wonderful. I, you know, those are so easy to like take with you and read on the bus, you know, um, and that's, I think, and that's a format that a specific younger audience is really into in terms of something that, again, they can stick in their purse and read it on the bus. Um, I think, it, you well, know, I, I think. Well, the old Archie comics. More, exactly like the like the archie comics get an archie double digest of phantom right mm -hmm. um where you know phantom has to choose between betty and veronica oh no um <laughs> but we actually, um we have actually talked on the podcast on who we prefer to have betty and veronica as well so <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah you know so i feel like there's you know i i feel like taking the phantom into some other publishing formats would really be the thing that would excite me the most. Um, I think it would be a great way to bring new audiences on board, but also to tell some stories that you can't really tell the same way in a, you know, in a short form comic, I think, you know, or a comic strip. I think, um, you know, you look at like the old novelizations, it would be so, f so much fun to like take some of those novelizations and turn them into graphic novels. So it, you'd have like this kind of like, we took the we took the serial story. We turned it into a novel. We're taking the novel and turning it into a long long form comic. That would be like mm. the coolest thing on earth. <laughs> it, it, it it pleases me that they um, talking about. This. I was going to ask a question along this line because um, I, you know, ten or however many years ago when Kindles came out and everyone started reading their books digitally on a handheld device and bookstops bookshops started closing. But this is my own observations. I see people buying books again and actually having the, <coughs> excuse me, the hard copy of it. And so to hear you talk about um, having like a, uh, <coughs> a digest size or, or a graphic novel and looking into that market and getting people in, um, I, I do like that idea and I, hope, and I hope that does come to fruition. Yeah, I, I think it, I think it would be a ton of fun, and and you can sell those digitally too. There's a you know a mm. huge digital market for graphic novels, um, and they're honestly Phantom Webtoon would be awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, like have a you know doing just like a you know Phantom comic in that you know in that Korean web comic format where everything scrolls up and down, like like we're trying to do with the Sunday comics, mm. but yeah. doing a long form story like that. Would be super fun um you know so those are sorts of the, those are the sorts of things that i think would be really exciting to you know to get some publishers on board for i like what you did with um flash where you got the artists to do their own interpretations of flash like there was oh. massimo gambera and and and, yeah so yeah. Be, maybe maybe that's a, a another avenue where you can kind of have these little web comics 
of the fans and then yeah that's a, such a fun project we did it with popeye a couple years ago as well and it's it's so much fun to write to like get um get like classic artists like Massimo Gambari and then get, you know, get some newer folks, uh, like some web cartoonists and, uh, yeah. you know, web cartoonists, animators, graphic novelists who are coming from completely different perspectives on comics to all take these classic characters and do their own spin on them. It's mm -hmm. I, I just I, I love everything that they do because every single one is so different. Mm -hmm. And that's when you it can really introduce, is. <laughs> that's when you can introduce like the Flash or the crazy cat and all those other type of characters that wouldn't fit in a free comic, but in a little fun, little web comic, they, they quite easily go together. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Mm. Um, um, my, my uh, local comic store guy wanted me to, uh, to ask about American, um, American license or American produced comic books. Cause he reckons that uh, certainly the dynamite, the moonstone before it, even the, uh, the Hermes press recently, the, the newly created stuff, um, all flies out the door when it arrives. So, um, what are the? Where are we? Oh, I guess this is a license question again. I'm sorry, but it's uh, a licensing question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I don't writers. really. I yeah, I don't really know. I know that it's something that you know that uh, our licensing team is working on. They would love to uh, love to bring somebody on to do some more phantom stories. Mm. Uh, you know, but but I don't know exactly where that is or who they've been talking to lately. So I can't give you I can't give you much more. No, that's right. It's that. just that yeah. the American market seems to be a difficult one for uh, for for really long term producers of Phantom Comics. Um, with Moonstone, I think over what fifteen years, Germ being about the the yeah. longest period of time that an American and then you, and then you compare that to Egmont and Fru, which have been going for you know forever. Plus years, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. It was a real pity that Moonstone um, lost or, or lost the license to um, Dynamite because uh, Moonstone were doing such a great job. Even fans now talk about it. We've had Moonstone creators on the podcast and they're always popular podcasts and stuff like that. And people are still trying to hunt down the comics and, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it was a, a, a real shame that we lost Moonstone. See, that's super helpful feedback for me to know. So, you know, because that's something that I will, you know, I can definitely let the licensing team know that and, you know, and, and you know, make sure that they are, make sure that they're aware that there is definitely yeah. an appetite among fans for more of those, or at least when, whether it's more from Moonstone or more comics similar to what Moonstone was doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you've got our email address. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're more than happy to give you our opinion. And, uh, we, we give it our opinion <laughs> all the time on the podcast as well. So, and, yeah. and, and it's always oh, Jen's that. been sitting on the fence lately. <laughs> um, I know, I know, we're cutting in. I know you've uh, we've only got a couple more minutes. So, guys, we've got one more question each, uh, and then we uh, and then we better say goodbye. So, Steve, you got a question? I've actually got no more questions. I've, I've, everything I've wanted to ask has been, has been asked, really. Yeah. So, I just want to say thank you for your time and, and thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. This is super fun. Yeah, I'm glad to, and I've really enjoyed chatting to you as well. One of the things that I've really picked up is um, and you used the word a few times about being a steward and you talked about Lee Fork's stewardship of the Phantom and, and to what Tony DePaul is doing as steward of the Phantom. But certainly in, in your role uh, as the, uh, in the editorial role, as, as much as anyone, you're a steward of the Phantom and uh, you've certainly filled me with a lot of confidence in terms of the way that um, the characters, you know, the hands that the character is in. So thank you very much for Thanks. the work you do and, um, and, and your time tonight, certainly. Yeah, I thank you so much. And I really, I, I really believe that. I think that, you know, folks who get into a position like mine, you know, there's, I think, a real, um, there's a real danger of feeling like an owner of a character instead of a steward of a character. And it's so important to me to, you know, with every single character that we represent that, my job is to really deeply think about the original creator's vision and how we can keep that alive and how we can keep that going. Um, not, you know, come in and be like, wouldn't it be cool if we did this? Uh, you know, so can't we make the Phantom into Green Lantern? Yeah, you know, I, I don't want to do that. I think it's important for me to be really respectful of the history and that, you know, I'm, I'm a person who's been cho chosen to to lead Lee Falk's memory forward. And, and that's so important. Mm, that's, that's great. And the, and the passion with which you've been speaking this, um, of this evening for us, it, it's, it's really heartwarming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>
So I've got one more question, and then I want to say thanks as well. Um, first of all, I also wanted to say thank you for giving us the, the license for the um, firebook, the Phantom uh, Bush Firebook, which I think... Oh, this yeah. This one, one here? Yeah. Yep. I want yeah. to say um, thank you. I'll hold up mine, but I'm sitting in my car. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I... Wanted... I, I... <laughs> I didn't give it to you, but you're welcome. No. I, from King Features, <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah, on behalf of uh, us to King Features, uh, whoever that was, um, yeah. you're the only person we know, so you get, yeah. <laughs> um, you get all the thanks. <laughs> so, yeah, just thanks for giving us the, um, the license to be able to do that book. That was a lot of fun. Um, I'm not sure Great. if you were aware, but we raised over 25000 uh, for. Um, oh, congratulations. That's amazing. I'm so glad yeah. to hear that. So, um, yeah. And then my question is, is as a collector, and you can probably see this is half of my room that I'm in at the moment, is there a, like a, a secret room or something at King Features <laughs> or something that has like a copy of everything? So there is a secret room, but it doesn't have a copy of everything. A lot, a, col, most of the collectors actually have more stuff than we have. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I honestly, like we do have, we do have a sample closet and the sample closet, we get samples of every piece of merch that's gonna go out. And um, so that, and we approve them the same way that I approve the books. We have someone whose job is looking mm. at the merchandise and saying, okay, yes, the Phantom looks correct. That's the correct shade of purple or no, the Phantom doesn't wear green or whatever. And, um, and he looks at all of the merchandise and approves it before, um, before they mass produce it for people who want it. And so we do have a room that has a lot of those samples in them, but Every once in a while, we need to make room for more samples, and we do giveaways at the office, and and folks can come and take the stuff that you know belongs to their favorite characters. So, I've got I've got I've got a lot of crazy cat stuff. You can't see any of it right now, <laughs> but I have, I have a lot of crazy cat stuff. I've got a bunch of Flash Gordon stuff. I have a couple Phantom things. I've got I've got I've got a Barney Google statuette. So we've got some fun stuff, and it's it's one of the best things about. Oh, I and mean, it's not one of the best things, but it is one of the fun things about working. Sounds at like King the best. Features. There's got to, there's got to be like good things. Thing. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, if you ever have phantom stuff that you can't get rid of, we're more than happy to use it as prize. We can send our postal address. Uh, yeah. <laughs> more okay. than happy to more than happy to use it as prizes for uh, for our website and stuff like that. We do a lot of prizes and that. But um, yeah, thank you, thank you, T, for um for joining us uh it, it was a great pleasure like we said at the intro this is something that a lot of us a lot of fans us included have wanted we we've oh that's so we've great wanted to be able to hear from you we wanted to be able to talk to you um because you know we have a lot of people saying oh what about you know why did king features do this or, or why is this and it's just good to be able to i guess hear it from the person mm. who actually oh. is there and to be able to either correct us or, or give us more insight um, and set the record straight um, that you're not some meanie in the silver tower that you love. Oh, I don't know. I can be pretty mean, stuff. but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, thank you yeah. so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. I, you know, it's, it's always amazing to talk to fans who have such a deep love for, you know, for a character like the Phantom, it's just really heartwarming. So thank you so much and uh, have a great day. You no, too. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. All thank right. Thank you so much, Pete. Bye. Okay. Thank you, T, uh, for, for joining us. Thank you for um, uh, giving us an hour and a half of your time with the podcast. Boys, was that good or what? Oh, that it was an hour and a half, but it flew past. Um, mm. I was just, you know, it was just wrapped to... to hear someone who is so across the phantom and the phantom world and and all things and and every story we brought up yep i know that one off the top of my head i know this i know the plot line you're talking about um yeah uh really love talking to experts in their field and and uh and someone with passion and you said that at the end there too steve the passion that mm. with with which she was speaking it was fantastic to listen to yeah and especially when she's got well, it at least 60 characters who are in print yeah. that she's got to be aware of. And um, so she obviously did her homework for us and, and, and I, I found it awesome to, to, to talk with and, and to listen to. And yeah, the, the time flew, like I was looking, I was watching the time, you know, when we started, geez, we're going to, we're going to feel this hour and a half, you know, kind of wrap it up in half, in 30 minutes, 45. She was speaking, speaking really well and answering questions that we hadn't had a chance to um, ask yet. 
which I thought, which is always great mm-hmm. where, where you want to hit want, where, what you want in an interview um, when they're yeah when they're already answering questions that you haven't had an opportunity to ask it, um, which just goes into that passion and that knowledge of the character, which is which is so good and so pleasing to hear um, that the people up in head office um, are, are like that, and it's not to say that um, oh, I think she mentioned at some stage you know she can be pretty mean i'm sure there are some robust discussions sometimes between um publishers or or story creators and and that sort of thing but um and no matter what their differences are in the the clash and um and this is true and i think in any industry if if you're clashing that's great as long as you you both have this goal of this character or you're whatever you're, you're into becoming greater and um Hmm. You might have different yeah. ideas of how to get there, and that's where the discussion and the dialogue comes into it. So, and so they have these um, processes now um, for Fru and Egmont, um, as well as these, you know, whoever new decides to publish, I think is a good idea. Um, hmm. So, well, what they, want, I, they, want, they want creativity, but they also want consistency in the character. Yeah. And I think that's the good thing about having that new process is it, it, it allows the guidelines to sort of be, you know, set, as you say. And then, you know, you can still push against the boundary, um, but there's, yeah, there's those guidelines. And I think it's, I think it's a good idea having a, a similar process for every creator. Um, as much as mm. maybe Fru and Egmont don't like it as much, I think it is, I think it's going to be good. Um, and the, uh, I, I think, I think when we really, oh, oh, sorry, Dan, you go. Mm. No, I was just going to say, I think that um, in the fullness of time, like there's going to be some teething problems, particularly with Egmont, who have had um, so little oversight over such a long time, you know, since the 1970s um, or 60s since they've been creating their own stories and and very rarely had, um, you know, to, 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 to deal with editorial control yeah. from King Features. So, of course, there's going to be some teething problems and there's going yeah. to be some... Um, you know, concerns with process to begin with and that sort of thing. But down long, long term, I genuinely believe it, it, it's for the best. And uh, for all the reasons I said, as, as we were saying goodbye to T there, is about um, uh, keeping that stewardship of the Phantom and, and, and so that it does go comfortably for 100 years and, and, and yeah. well beyond. Yeah. It's, it's the same character that we love now. And, and like T uh, mentioned as well, I think when, I think she alluded to this, I don't think she actually set it up. Um, as specific um, in regards to this approval process, um, particularly in regards to fruit, um, oh, you no longer have to send us that stuff. But the, the, I think they went very hard. By the sounds of it, they went hard early and then realised we don't need to see that. You guys have got that covered and, and dial it back. And, you know, it's the same as, you know, you know in teaching, Then you go hard early and then you can always you can always dial back. It's, it's hard to dial up. Yeah. yeah. And... I, I don't think I think with 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 Tony, Glenn and Andreas, who are kind of like the you know the the head creators of the newspapers, Fru, and also Egmont, you don't really need to be too hard because Tony's been writing Phantom stories since since the mid nineties. Um, you know, Glenn's been a fan since the fifties. He won't like me telling everyone roughly how old he is but uh, and then andreas has been a fan and fan since the 80s and not an early 90s as well so these are these are three guys that that know their fans from, as well as us or, you know and in some cases maybe even more hopefully better i did this story. Hope better. <laughs> so you know these are guys that are you know these are they're super fans they you know they know everything that's going on as well. So, I, you know, I think that makes their life easier because they don't have to be harsh because they want to, they have the best interests of the Phantom in mind as well. Mm. Mm. And I think when we listen, and I'm going to be listening back to this podcast because as, as she was talking and being mindful of the time, I'm like, I want to ask this question. And then I'm like, nope, can't ask that question. And, you know, and I'm sure there's going to be plenty of other people out there, including us and our listeners who are going, what about this question? Why didn't you ask this question? Um, And so I think this this is a podcast that you will have to listen to a couple of times. Um, And while we're talking about questions, uh, a big thank you to our Patreons who actually submitted some of the questions that we did ask. Um, so we did a bit of a, a shout out to all our patrons. Um, and so in <coughs> no particular order, uh, we have Callum, Sean, 
Duncan, Mikel and Ankit. And I think there might be one or two others that I've forgotten who actually did submit their questions. So a huge thank yous to you guys and to our Patreons. Um, as you may be aware that it's episode 191, so we're thinking about something for episode 200 for the Patreons, but they'll learn more about that later. Um, if you like what you've heard, if you like everything about the Phantom, uh, the best place to find anything about the Phantom, news related, uh, comics reviews, product reviews, every, anything is our website, which is chroniclechamber.com. If you have more questions or you want to give us feedback or anything like that, the best place is our email address, which is chroniclechamber at gmail.com. We're also on social media, uh, which is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, and then, of course, to be able to listen to all of our podcasts, uh, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, or the various Android apps like Podbeam, Player FM, CastBox, Listen Notes. And, of course, you can listen to us on YouTube, which I would recommend everyone going onto YouTube because there's some great conversations and comments from our fans on there as well. Um, don't forget, mm. you can comment also on social media as well. We love hearing from you guys, so please drop us a line, drop us a comment, drop us a, a, a like or a love or, or whatever. Um, again, or a critique, help us be better. Yes, a critique. Um, critique may be better via our email, so that way I don't look like <laughs> uh, uh, total uh, dunces. Um, but uh, again, special thank you to T and Marley for helping us organise tonight. Um, Dan, Stephen, thank you for staying up. Well past your bedtime. Um, for myself, now you time to wake up. <laughs> well, just for, just I'll, I will say, Jim, congratulations to you, mate, because um, I know that you've been, as you've said, we've all been wanting to talk to King Features for a long time. You actually um, have been in conversation with people and working your way up through the system to get to T over months and months now, setting this podcast up. So, uh, well done to you for your persistence and, and getting it off the ground because it was a fascinating conversation to be part of and I really hope that people enjoy uh, listening to it as well. So kudos to you, mate. No worries. Thank you. Yep. We're here for the fans. <laughs> By fans, for the fans. And now, Jem, there's another challenge. We've spoken to the, to the editor. Now we need to talk to someone in licensing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, we do. And you may notice we're all wearing fancy <laughs> Well, I'm not because I'm dressed for the weather. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but everything's licensed here. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, from us, Five thank you. Sorry. Happy Phantoming, guys. Happy Phantoming. Happy Phantoming. And upon the skull of the man who killed his dad, he said, I'm mad, I must eradicate piracy, injustice and cruelty. And all my sons will follow me, so evil doers will believe that this Man cannot die. The Phantom, the ghost who walks. The Phantom, enemies beware. The Phantom's always there, but you won't find the Phantom. He finds you.